Gerard Adams calendar on the 21st of June 2010, the winter solstice in the southern hemisphere, and we just witnessed the sunrise over the stones, Michael Pierre. the central stones of Adams calendar, and uh, we're about to do a little insert for a documentary here in South Africa with a program called 5050. So it's a very wonderful occasion because it's the first time that we're really documenting this for, for television, mainstream television as well, and Project Camelot. At the moment, Project Camelot is taking a back seat to a South African professional television crew for a very well-known TV show in South Africa. And so you can see that they have a very sophisticated cinematographer who knows his business. They have a professional boom guy. They have a geologist here, and they're about to interview Michael. So Project Camelot is standing by and snapping shots whenever they can. It's freezing out here. This little precinct right here. This little precinct right here is very important. This is where, according to Kredo Mutwa and a number of psychic revelations is where the insemination happened of the Anunnaki females, which is very important, obviously, to us as a human race. The color of the soil here is red, and all of African soil is red. Which it's said that Africa should be, and probably is, as it is, the breadbasket of the world. We could grow so much, so many crops here. It's crazy. Everything grows like crazy. You stick a, you know, put a stick in the ground, and next year it's a tree. So now this is what's huh. interesting. When you read the Sumerian tablets and the translations, especially of Sitchin, and so forth, then it talks about the fashioning of Adamu, and when Adamu was born, and they say, look, at, look at the the color of his skin. They describe his features. He had short black hair, short curly black hair, and his skin was smooth as the Anunnaki. But the color was dark red, uh. dark red like the soil, like the color of the soil huh. of the deep Abzu. And there you have it, the color of the soil of the deep Abzu. Wow. So it's a very clear indication of what the first humans looked like. I see. Red people. Now what's interesting is that the oldest, arguably the oldest people on earth are the Bushmen. The Bushmen are probably the, genetically the oldest people we still have today. And what do the Bushmen call themselves? The Red People. They don't call themselves the Yellow or the White. They call themselves the Red People, who are probably the closest descendants um. of the first humans created here in the Abzu, in the mountains around us, right here. And that's the color of the skin they had. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. I love it. Well, you know, because of Sedona, I love the Red Earth. Uh, I just have a thing about Red Earth some reason it has a lot of power. I don't know what it is. Did you have a fish eagle? Yes. It's a... I just heard it. Yeah. There's some fish eagles down near the dams down there. There's a lot of natural trout springs here in this area. Oh, it's really? In the bathroom area. Wow. Freshwater trout, but there's huge trout farms. Oh, around fabulous! Here. Huge trout farms because okay. it's all fresh and it's unsaluted water. Willem, you're not coming with us. Then. Where to? Yeah, to Adam's Canada. Yes, I'm coming. Yeah. Okay. Is if you have one psychic telling you something, uh, then it's interesting. If the second psychic comes along that hasn't never met the previous one and tells you exactly the same bit of information, you say, oh, that's curious. By the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the tenth, the twelfth psychic that has now told you the same list of things that are identical to all the others about this specific site, you've got to say to yourself, hold on, what's going on here? And then what I'd like to do as a scientist, I'd like to say, well, is there a way of turning this hocus-pocus psychic mumbo-jumbo into a scientific argument? Yeah. And you can do that very simply. And that is, you say, what is the statistical probability that 12 or 20 psychics have told me a list of 12 or 15 things that are identical about Adam's calendar and the stone circles? And the statistical probability is several billion to one. And this is the quaint little village of Kaab Sahup. It means Cape Hope. 
That's or the ho hope of hope of the Cape. And the Cape is hundreds of kilometers from Well, it's a thousand miles away from here. So what is the significance of this place? It's a mining gold rush town. Ah. There were about 15,000 people that lived here in the 18, oh, really? 1880s, from 1880 when they discovered the gold. But Michael has to be the visionary. Yes, sure. That's He's right. got to say, yes, I This think. is the theory, this yes. is the theory, and Absolutely. I will come up and say, but prove it to me. No. And I come up with proof, and that helps him again to... Absolutely. Michael wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to see the way he does if he was too... Practical. Practical, yeah. yes. So you need somebody to compensate him. Yes, what, yeah. So, yeah. So, Johan, tell me how you got into all of this, because I understand you have a huge company that you fight forest fires. Fires, yeah. So, now, what, what happened is um, I've been flying, fighting forest fires since 1986, 85, actually, 1985. And I saw the ruins, and when inquiring about them, people just said they they insignificant uh, uh, cattle uh, enclosures, cattle crawls, enclosures, and, and residents. Uh, from a couple of hundred years ago. So I accepted it until I met Sil Romnik. I flew him around um, and I organized aerial uh, helicopters for Cyril to go and research. He was busy with the research. Cyril has done tremendous Best work, work yeah. on linking ancient civilization in South Africa to the Hindu and the Dravidian Hindu culture. Cultures. Right. And there's ir incredible evidence and how that has enriched the history of this country. country yeah. But Johan, do you have a scientific background? No. So what made you interested in this area? Cyril Romnik. No, Cyril. Romnik, I went with him, and then I said to him, okay, I'll take photographs for you. I'll, I'll let me organize aerial photographs, because he didn't have... So I took all the photographs I sent to him, and he did nothing with it. And then I thought, okay, let me start now. And that slowly I started. And when I found something amazing, and then you get more inquisitive, you find something more amazing, more inquisitive, find them, and it actually... That's how I just eventually Adam's calendar, and I looked at this and thought, no, something is something to this. Wow. And then I came here in the mornings and the evenings and started measuring it, and then I got the surveyor to measure it to substantiate my theory that this is a calendar. But if it was so important, if it was so sacred, why, why did they abandon it? That we need to figure out. For each statement, there's, there's three questions. I have a lot know. of theories, but we don't have time for those now. But I have a lot of theories. Yeah. Yeah. And these are the theories that I talk about. No, they abandoned it because they lost the knowledge of it. Yeah. A lot, a lot, of, theory, of, a lot of knowledge has been lost. Of what it, of what it meant. You see, I mean, obviously, if you lose the knowledge, you lose the interest. Well, didn't you but just why? say that the flood? The I, flood is didn't the flood, the flood is the most come important in? thing. I believe. That's Thirteen thousand years ago, the flood Lots came. Lots of knowledge it had to be lost. I mean, all of Atlantis was lost, right? Thank you. There are a lot of people that don't believe Atlantis even exists. Not only that, not only that, but the knowledge lost was enforced on the human race by the reptilians. Right. But and this is a, something that some people still have a problem with, and it's okay if they have a problem with it. Then, then they must go away and do some more research. I watched a, a program last night on the blue holes in the Caribbean, where they dive down the brew holes, they cut those minerals and they cut them in half and they, I don't know if you've seen it, and they, and they then determined when the floods, when catastrophic events happened on earth and they, it's amazing there and then how in those, um, um, uh, what is it called? Um, the cores? No, the cores, yeah, yeah. Of, the, of the, in the cave down the bottom. It's the best preserved history, pres preserved history of the world. It's like a tree trunk. Yes. Yeah. And they said, well, that happened, I don't know how many thousand years ago, but that's what's happening now in the Sahara. It has happened seven times in the recent history, where, where severe drought in the Sahara no, leads to sun, uh, this rise of the seas, and a lot of the cities, all the cities are going to be covered in, in low-lying cities in, in, in the sea, and you'll probably get some other... Well, people that it's believe in, that's in cataclysms in 2012 and beyond are saying that same thing's going to happen again. Yeah. So who knows? They had proof there. The the scientific proof that it did happen. They analyzed the materials in there, everything. But Where did you see that, Johan? On Natural Geographic last night. The blue oh, holes. Last night? Yeah. The blue holes. Blue holes. Something about the blue holes, the diving on the, in the blue holes. I must look at that. Hmm. It's very interesting. Well, is that how... Proof. That's. I mean, that's scientific proof that floodings did occur. And the last one was. I can't remember the dates now. I said it was. 
13,000? 11,000? Yes, that's right. And then there's one 70, uh, and, uh, before about 15,000, 16,000. And then they, they go back to 27,000 mm. and 34 or something. But the, the one that they've got on there was seven, uh, 11,000. Yeah, but that's, the com that's one that everybody knows about. Yeah. 11,000, 11,500 BC. BC, yes. Yeah. There that's about the big one. Yes. There about. And there was proof that, it's, that it actually yeah. happened. Okay, so here we are at Adam's calendar. Uh, it's the 21st of June 2010, the winter solstice in South Africa in the Southern Hemisphere. And we just saw a magnificent sunrise this morning. We are lucky that there were no clouds or, or mist in the air, which happens often. And we're about 700 meters above the valley below, the Barberton Valley. Sometimes we call it an impact crater. There's still some argument about whether it is an impact crater. And this is the sort of the greatest circle of Adam's calendar is runs around here and originally you can look at it from go on Google you'll see originally it was a circular structure a circular stone structure pretty much like Stonehenge um, in the middle right there are the two calendar stones which are very important the front stone casts a shadow on the stone behind it and every day you can tell every day of the year by where the shadow is when the Sun sets so the calendar still works it's still accurate even though it is 285,000 years old is what we believe it to be. Um, as you can see, the stones are leaning towards the edge of the cliff. That's purely just from soil shift of thousands and thousands of years. Most of the stones that, that were on the edge of the outside ring have fallen down now, lying flat on the outer ring of the, uh, of the, the, the calendar. And uh, that is the northern stone marker. That is the southern stone marker over there under the tree and then over here is where the stone man stood this is where the stone man was taken out of right here and the stone man stood here and lined up with the sunrise on the spring equinox about 285,000 years ago right there and there's an alignment of five stones on the outer perimeter of this original circle uh, Crater Mutwa calls the stone man actually the clitoris of Mother Earth and he says this is where heaven mated with Mother Earth and uh, for about a year after he told me that I didn't figure out what that meant until eventually the penny dropped for me when he also said that Adam's calendar is one of the two most sacred sites on earth the other one is the serpent worship site in northern Botswana known as the Sodilo Hills and we're going to be going there very soon to look at what we believe is a flower of life carved out on, on a rock there. Um, but to come back here, so Adam's calendar is where heaven mated with Mother Earth. And I believe that it is here where the Anunnaki females were impregnated and uh, in, well, impregnated with the fertilized eggs of the first human beings. Now, I just want to quickly show you in the middle of Adam's calendar how it's lined up that the north-south line cuts right through the calendar so when you go here and you stand in between the two calendar stones it's exactly in the middle all this work was done by Johann Heine when he first discovered it he spent five years measuring and working out where the sun rises and so forth and a lot of hard work that Johann Heine did over an extended period and it takes a lot of work and dedication to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to come here and then, you know, it's misted in or clouded and you've got to come back the next day. So this is the north-south line exactly through the middle. So, and why do you call this the Horus Stone? Because it's, it's, it's carved in the shape of a big bird that in Egypt would be, call, would be called the Horus bird. And um, it was covered up to here with soil. Yeah, when we first found it so we thought that this was just a you know the rock came down here into a point or something and ended there and when we cleared the soil away here we realized that it's actually the head of the bird and there's the nose coming out there beautifully carved out neck there's a fat belly over there it's beautiful and you stand it up it's more than three meters tall so yes. if you stand this thing up it's going to be spectacular <laughs> and together with the one right next to you which is beautifully carved and pointed look at this point beautifully pointed to the mm -hmm. as a to a tip here this one that rock and that rock are the three rocks of Orion's belt they're the ones that line up with the rise of Orion um, you know more than 160,000 years ago
obviously they've all fallen down and it's very difficult to try and see this because it's so old and so people need to keep reminding themselves of this is so old that it boggles the mind so we find a very strong link and a direct relationship between Horus and Orion uh, at the rise of the sun on the spring equinox and over here we've got what I believe is to be the head of Inanna it comes from this this piece of rock here which is actually the body of a sphinx that has fallen over the back of it is over there it comes back here and it ends here right here that's where it ends and what I believe happened is that this statue was standing up here um, these were obviously standing up though so there's another man shaped or a, a humanoid shape here yes. and one there and those are standing up and this was standing up here and when this one fell over the head hit that rock and it bounced back and landed over there and then it got covered by soil this is what we believe is Dumuzi's grave right on the edge it's the northern site of Adam's calendar it's what we call the stone altar uh, it's a well-known holy and sacred place among the Sangomas and shamans and uh, I figured out from the translations in the Sumerian tablets that this is probably where Dumuzi was buried where Inanna came down and buried Dumuzi right here infrared photography suggests that there's something about three meters tall buried under the stone altar and it faces east towards the pyramids the pyramids down there we're probably only seeing this much of them because when the flood came through here and that's incidentally why this hasn't been destroyed because this was built after the flood that's why it's still here otherwise everything was covered by water here and I think much of Adam's calendar was probably destroyed by the moving water uh, but because the calendar stones are facing north-south that probably spared them from being pushed over I don't know these are just things that I'm thinking about you know you got to put bring all these things together but if you look at the pyramids down there imagine a wall of water a kilometer high coming from south down there south north and flooding all that valley down there and um, and depositing all the millions and millions of tons of soil and sediment on top of the pyramids so we suspect that the pyramids are probably only sticking out half of them or maybe even less because the third pyramid there are three pyramids two big ones and one small one to the right of the two pyramids just like in Giza right and if you look at which way the the tail of the sediment is aligned it aligns towards the north so it also suggests that if they are indeed pyramids which we believe they are and the sediment came and deposited on them it left behind a bit of a tail of sediment facing north the statue of Inanna which is lying down the this escarpment in what we call the the workshop one of the stones that has been clearly worked and carved is clearly a bust of a human and if this is in fact where Inanna buried Dumuzi and Dumuzi is buried here then that could be the statue of Inanna and then we have the Sphinx and the Sphinx and Isis the Sphinx is often referred or associated with Inanna as well um, here we have what we also have taken is infrared photographs of this spot here and the infrared photographs tell us very clearly that there's something about three meters deep buried under the soil here about three meters deep which is about three meters long and we know that the Anunnaki were taller than humans so there's another potential argument that if Dumuzi is buried here and he was the Anunnaki the son of Enki that he may have been three meters tall he was one of the giants all of Natal okay. is covered in a, a, a recent deposit of silts and sand very recent that the geologists call the mass Masuchini formation and you don't know how old that and, is and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think but I know it's well, it, it, it'll be means, great if it's about 13,000 years old which means, well <laughs> it, it, I, I, know, I know it goes from today back so yeah. it, 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 I don't know exactly how old it, I think it goes back to about 40,000 years or something oh that's beautiful now you, you see if, if if this will be associated with the Masucheni, it will have another name in the, in the front wall. But if this is, 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 is a thick layer of alluvium and colluvium material that the people describe as coming down the hillsides, and, because they don't think holistically, they, they, they describe it as from just from here, mm -hmm. moving over into the flood pit. If, if one can say extensive deposits of that formation occurs here, then one can start saying to you, oh, you know?
Yeah. But where did the water go from here? Just north? Did yeah, just I think it went north. It, 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 and and ah, this is the other beautiful thing I forgot to mention. If you look at the pyramids, yeah. what I believe yeah. are pyramids, yeah. 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 if the Sumerian tablets are true mm. and accurate, mm. that mm. the water and the flood moved from the south to the north, okay. which direction would have, if you had a pyramid and it was covered by moving water mm. from south mm. to north, mm. in which direction would, have, would it have left a, a longer depository tail of some sort? Mm. No, but to the mm. northern side. Yeah. And that's exactly what you find there. The, the deposit of the, when you fly over it, you can see there's a deposit there's a tail, going, tail going north mm. on both of them. Not here, not there, it goes north. That will, so that will again, you see, that, 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 that will go off to, uh, you see, just logically, the, the, the water would actually, to, to get off out of South Africa, it needs to go along uh, 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 the Mozambique yeah. areas out there. It'll go up, see. up, up. And, and, and you see, yeah. it, it would, it would, 13,000 years ago, I can guarantee it would follow the, uh, the Rift Valley of Africa. So it would go all the way, uh, Malawi, Ethiopia, and end where it actually exits. Funny enough, it will exit into the Red Sea and go through the Zeus Channel. Yeah, into Egypt. In, into Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay. Very, very interesting. So that is, that is our, you can use the lichens to date how long this thing has been exposed. But remember that this actually removes it and you start over again. Mm. So the lichen doesn't, it can't stay here forever. No. So what is interesting is that one there, if that is then from 1994, oh. now, you can, now you can say, okay, that little one grew since 94 to today, that is the size. Right, yes. You see, and then you can and, and you can start looking at that as, a, as a way of saying, in 1994 this rock was clean. You know, the only other thing I need to add to this, okay, yeah. that mm. this That's rock important. was covered in lichen already. Mm. That's so right. it's it's easier to seed it in this area. Mm. If you've got a clean rock that's unseeded with lichen, it takes a lot longer for the lichen to establish. So those are the other th important things to take into consideration. Sure, if, you, if you quote me on it, I will deny it. Uh, well, then, then it's useless. Exactly. Yeah. No, but I do that. And that's what I do. If they tell me that, I say, good, I'll quote you, but I won't mention your name. So that's what I do. Uh, so like I said earlier in my interview, I've had two very well-known academics in South Africa tell me things, but they told me, you may not quote me, because I will deny it, because I will lose my job. Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> And this uh, is a problem. Uh, that's where, where I, I, you know, my, my way of thinking is that, is, you know, why, why, as, long, as long, long as you're prepared to reason yeah. within reason, why don't do it? Reason, exactly. and, then, exactly. and then people can comment on what, what you think. think. And uh, you must. Boom, please. You, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be scared to, wait for the to actually helicopter. talk about this stuff. Exactly. Yeah. But some people are really scared. They. They are driven by fear. They are overcome by fear. They don't want to talk about anything that's outside the box. And, and it's like, this is what I find exciting, especially in the area that Kerry and Project Camelot, the area that they work in, mm. they just open everything. They rip apart everything. Yeah, well and they talk to people. That, and they that's, how people. New, that's how new thoughts are generated. You know, if you are prepared to, to open your mind, and in, in, in my case, you know, looking, looking at this, it is, this, this is the very exciting geology uh, because, it, you know, what, what is really interesting about the site here is that these rocks, geologically, it's very difficult to explain why they are here. For me, it's very difficult because I'm, I'm trying to figure out the geology and you've got the quartzites in the bottom. You've got some of this intrusive stuff up there. Then you've got the quartzites up there. Then you've got this block of intrusive stuff, and then you've got intrusive stuff over there with quartzites, and there's there's some dolomites over there as well. So, geologically, to, to explain why these rocks are here, will will need a little bit of work. You need to, and that's why I say, before you come to a final conclusion, let's do a little bit of research. Let's get the electromagnetics in. Let's get magnetic uh, meter in, and just see. Are we working with a dolerite dike? Now, you know, if it's a dolerite dike, then this structure was cut through this mountain mm. because it must be intrusive through here. Yes. But there's quartzites down here. Yeah. So, so it can't be. So it can't be. Okay, now the next thing, then it must be a dolerite sill, which is a structure that comes in like a, a blade line, but then 
it should extend all the all, way along. Exactly. That's what yeah. I've been... And it doesn't see, do that. So now, I've had a few that. geologists now, say... How on earth do you get this thing yeah. here? Because you, you, it's, not, it's not a dike, it's not a sill. Yeah. And, and, and so these rocks, are, are, it's very difficult to bring them here geologically. And, 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 and uh, on the other hand, with dolerites, we know they can pop up where they want to. They melt, they melt and stuff. They mm. could come in where they can be little kind of yeah. pieces of it. Yeah. So uh, it might be that this is just one dolerite intrusion. Yeah. yeah. Might, and there's another one there. Yeah. Or these rocks have been carried here by, by human beings yeah. from over the hill. Because there we know there's a lot. Exactly. So it's either being carried in or they are part of the geology. And, and you, 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 you really need to do some research to prove what, what you want. You know, if, if the mag magnetrometer picks up a, a clear structure here, you know it's intrusive from underneath and coming in. If, if this is a, a mixture of loose rocks with magnetics going everywhere, then you know these things have been dumped here and stacked and left. Exactly, and and that is the kind of thing that I'm prepared to 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 go on record with. I don't mind saying it. I don't know. Mm. You know why? Yeah, it's easy to say I don't know. Let's find out. And yeah, exactly. Once you found but out, not many people are brave enough to say I don't know. Yeah, yeah or or, uh, or even say what you just said now to say that these are po these are possibilities, and that that it is confusing. Even just exactly. by fr from a geological perspective, looking at this, the fact that we know this is a line. Mm with the sunrises, the equinoxes, the solstices, with north, south, east, west. I mean, that's a huge, that, that is a huge discovery. I mean, God bless Johann Heiner for finding this, you know, because I think this is one of the most important clues to the origins of humankind that we have. Because I've got stone tools and stone artifacts that are just outside the paradigm of no, normal stone tools. There's, then, in fact, when I started showing these archaeologists, these stone tools, they told me, now these aren't stone tools, this is just, you're just imagining things. And yeah. I say, well, come and have a look at a collection of these. Oh, jeez, okay, now, now I see a repetitive pattern. <clears throat> and it covers the whole area, and you start realizing that they all come from near the stone circles. And you realize, hold on, so, and these are not normal, these are not carved stone tools. They are molded. They look like they've been molded. Okay, so it's not something that you carved, a typical kind of hand axes and scrapers and Something different. Now, for, 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 for me, from a, you know, from a geological point of view, and, and, and the uncertainty mm, sure. as, as to where these rocks actually come from, the, for me, the, 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 the context is important. Is that we, we are here looking at something that, that is related to the bigger, bigger picture of what you discovered. You know, the, these, these circular things and the whole of the of the of the of the environment we're looking at so if you if you if you as a geologist want to explain how the rocks uh, got here you have to come from a certain angle yeah. now if you can't use the geology and you then say but in the context of this entire <coughs> area people have been carried rocks around like you wouldn't believe it <laughs> I mean, look at your circular structures i mean their people were carrying rocks for kilometers and stacked them so then immediately it, it's not impossible that somebody actually did carry the rocks here. And, and that oh, is, oh, oh. you see, that is why the, the possibility of people bringing rocks is there now. Yeah. Because if you look at the bigger picture of how many tons of rocks has actually been carried in the times when, this, when, the, when, when these stone circles were built, then it becomes a possibility. Well, I did a quick calculation. Okay. And uh, it, it gets ridiculous. The numbers get so big in tons that you, uh, I don't know how many trillions of tons of stone have been moved and carried to build these structures. I'm talking about trillions of tons, not just millions and billions. Is, is that and, for all the structures in the entire Southern Africa? Yeah. And, and that, that was just the tip of the iceberg. You know? And then you start looking at the roads or these channels that link every stone ruin together. The fact that they're all built from the same stone. Okay, this is a very, another very important thing. All the way from Nelspreet, all the way across South Africa into Botswana, they all built out of one stone only, Hornfels. But this, uh, okay, but that, that's, the, that's a circular stone. That's a, those are stone circles. Uh, okay. This is not the calendar. And then uh, in among the Hornfels, uh, you have another anomaly that I'd love to show you, are these rounded stones that are all cracked like, like you took clay and you packed it into a rounded shape and then it, because it was disturbed, the energy of, was disturbed, and it got hard, it got all these cracks around the outside, 
and it's dolerite. It doesn't belong among the hornfowls. These hornfowls that have been rounded, that look like they come from tumbling waters okay. for a long time, on tops of the mountains, and it's not just random willy-nilly stone lying around. It's all hornfowls. Yeah. And we found out that the hornfowls is a very, you probably know this very well, very specific geological composition. It's 54% silica dioxide, it's about 28% aluminium, and the rest is iron. There's a bit of manganese in there. But its main important, most important property is its acoustic property. They ring like bells, and no, I'm going to show you. No, they no, ring no. like bells. So we're dealing with quartz crystal, something that is so close to quartz crystal, with very strong iron and aluminium and, and manganese. Now you realize, okay, these guys use the stone for very specific reasons. Now we recently measured the energy in these stone circles, and this is brand new research that we've done. We measured 72 dB at 14.5 gigahertz. So it's saying that these stone circles are screaming with sound frequency and sound energy. They are alive, but we can't hear them because it's outside our audible spectrum that we can perceive. We've also measured, recorded the stones, uh, more than 100 of them, and recorded their frequencies of, at which they ring when you hit them. And at the moment, and I believe the spectrum will be a lot larger, but the, what we've done in the preliminary recordings goes between 200 hertz and 16,000 hertz, which is very close to the human audio perceptive uh, frequencies. So now we start realizing that these guys use sound frequency as an energy source. And when you start looking at some of the strange stone tools, and especially the stone circles, or what they call the sacred stones, which I have one here as well, I'll show you. Now you start realizing they used sound as an energy source. They used it to levitate things, to drill holes with, to crush stone. This is not new. This is something that's been done 180, 120 years ago. John Keeley did it very successfully in the United States. Our current mining operations are starting to use it, I believe, vibrational frequency to crush things and break things and separate things. Well, they were doing this 300,000 years ago here already. And they used it in a way that they didn't destroy the environment. They use the natural energy from the earth. And this brings us to the other very important thing. Why are all these stone, cir stone structures circular? Why are they all circular and why is each and every one of them completely unique? Each one is like a fingerprint. Now Nikola Tesla told us 100 years ago already that the earth rings like a bell. And you probably know that the earth that, and sound, sound frequency yeah. comes out of the earth everywhere. Okay? If you know how to tap into that sound energy, you can turn it and convert it into any kind of form of energy that you want. Now, I believe that that's what he discovered when he, when he created his radiant energy that was then removed from human knowledge by the Illuminati because they didn't want us to have free energy. It's very simple. And now these guys are using this free energy 200, 300,000 years ago already. We've just measured it. We know it's there. So no one can deny that anymore. It's scientifically proven and we've just proved it. And um, so the reason why each one of these stone circles is unique is because it's actually the fingerprint of the energy as it comes out of the ground. It's like cymatics. When you take sand, put it on a metal plate, put a sound frequency through it, each frequency has a very specific and unique pattern that it creates. And so that's why each one of these stone circles, just take yourself away from the, from the stone circle and imagine the stones are actually sand pebbles. And the sound frequency is coming out of the ground. What's happened there is that the stones have arranged themselves according to the energy, the shape of the, the sound frequency energy as it comes out of the out of the ground there. They knew it like you and I know how to drive a car. Okay, like, we don't really yeah. know how the car works, but yet we drive it. So if they were given the knowledge by some advanced beings who understood this, they they just use that knowledge and move the stones into place based on then understanding how the what the energy grid looked like there. Each and every one of these circles on, in its original form was connected by what we call these roads and That's channels. Right. That's right. So, and when you start looking at some of the structures and you, and you compare some of the structures to modern technology, like magnetrons and klystrons mm. that you get in, in Nikola Tesla's death ray, in the Japanese death ray in the 1940s that they were going to smite the whole U, the, the Allied army. Well, the, the, cli the magnetron in that, in that death ray was about this size. You know, it was like six inches in diameter. And that magnetron generated so much energy that they could smite the entire Allied army. Now, imagine a magnetron that's 22 meters in diameter. Yeah. Okay, now we're dealing with many of the stone structures. 
were generating energy and they were magnetrons. A magnetron, I believe, from the current research I have, is that it's either got six or eight chambers around a central chamber. And then it's got the, the, the channel that comes out and that channels the energy outside, out into wherever you channel the energy to. And how does a magnetron work? It's got a central rod that you plug in and it vibrates and creates the sound frequency that then amplifies and creates the energy that you need. It's in your microwaves, it's in laser beams and so forth. Okay, there's north. Now look what happens as we go closer to the stones. Let's go this side. Look what happens. See what the north is doing. Look yes. how it's moving. Yes. Look at that. Why is it doing that? It's going 180 degrees. Look at that. Yeah, fascinating. Look at that. Do you know what, what does it mean? There is a lot of magnetic activity in the stone. I'm uh, Dr. Gideon Grunewald, and I'm a, a geologist working in South Africa on groundwater surveys and things like that. So, uh, working with the magnetic field of the Earth on a daily level, a daily basis. And if you, if you use an instrument that can record the electromagnetic field around the body of a person, like this uh, little bit of, of, of plant material that is wet, and you move closer to the rock, that is different in magnetic field to the field of the earth, it will immediately react and push the instrument away from where that field is. As you come back, it will react and go back again. So it's an effect of the magnetic field or the electromagnetic field that is around your body. It is not this little instrument. It's, it's, it's the effect of the magnetic field that you as a human being generate and the electromagnetic field that this rock is busy generating as it stands there yes. and the change is measured by the two fields reacting and that pushes the little instrument. Uh, is, are animals more sensitive to electromagnetic field than humans? Um, I, I would say yes and no. Yes in the sense that they record it and they react to it whereas human beings record it but don't react to it. Because, no, why I'm asking, people have told us, uh, the horse guys, that the horses don't like to go between the two rocks here. Absolutely. They yes. don't want to go in between yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they, will, they, will, they will feel something is wrong. Wrong. They will, they uh, will experience... That's the reason why. Because yeah. it puzzled me, because people said, yeah, when Krista comes here with his horses and stuff, that yeah. the horses yeah. refuse to go through the center of the two rocks there. Yeah. And they well, don't if, like if I, if I walk, mm. If I walk with this instrument towards this gap, um, it, it will probably even react above my head because it, it, it will, this, this, this is a serious look yeah. there. It, it, actually, it actually pulls it into the field there now. And, and, and uh, you know, eventually if you get to the other side it will, it will pop up again. But horses will surely not want to go through. Yeah. It's not only because they, they don't have sight vision, because that's one reason why they won't go through. They don't like going through a gap. But the other is that they actually, they, they feel the effect Energy. of the magnetic field. Well, welcome to my home in Waterfall Boef in South Africa. Um, and uh, just so you can see that this is real. There is a little place called Stone Circle Bistro with a museum that I'm going to take you to. And, um, and this yeah. is Michael's luxurious car. What is it? <laughs> that has 240,000 miles on it for all those people who think that he's actually making money off of doing all of this. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we now call Stone Circle Bistro. Uh, the museum is over there. There was just a, an old deserted double garage that we had to do a lot of work on converted and we added some another room onto it which is a little function room. But the idea that people come here and they come and look at the museum. I, I realized that when when Jan Heiner and I started working on the on the ruins that people are going to come here to look at the ruins and they're going to need to sit down and have a cup of coffee or want a sandwich and what's the point of me moving down here and then having to meet the people in the middle of the road or at the petrol station you know or something like that so and this was on the market um, it was quite expensive but it was a going concern as a little pub so I realized that there was an opportunity to make a stop for people that are interested in the ruins in the cultural heritage to come here, have a look at the museum, go out to the river, have a picnic, picnic by the river, um, and uh, and then from here decide what they want to do. It's also a halfway stop between Nelspruit and Johannesburg, 
So it's turning into a very nice little stopover and a place where people come and, and fill up on um, the knowledge of ancient civilizations, which they're completely not unaware of. You know, what happens to people, they arrive here, and they go, oh, there's a little, you know, there's a little bistro, a little pub, country restaurant, and then they get the menu and they read in the menu that this is the home of, you know, the oldest civilization on earth, and suddenly they go, wow, where can we see this? And they go into the bookshop inside. Um, I've got a little bookshop that I created next to the restaurant. And they see the books, and then they go to the museum, and then they want to go and see the ruins. So it's all developing that way. But, you know, as you realize, it takes a lot of work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> and it's been two years of non-stop work that has really pushed me to the edge. I must say, sometimes I just thought of giving up. Um, but I think we're about to turn the corner. As they say, most businesses take about two years to take off the ground. Well, we're at that two-year mark right now. <laughs> so let's see where it goes from here. The fact that you're here uh, is great. You know, Now everyone on Camelot will know about Stunts at right. the Bistro Absolutely. and the little museum and that they can come and have a picnic by the river. Uh -huh. It's a long way to have a picnic from L.A., but, you know, as you've seen, it's an But they'll come to see Adam's calendar, and, and you've trained at least one guide, right, besides yourself? Yeah, we, I've trained two guides. Two, okay. Um, and plus there's a new guy now that started guiding, the guys that are the bird guides as well. Okay. Um, so that's very exciting. Because Adam's calendar is also in a, a, a bird reserve? That's right, the Blue Swallow Reserve, yeah. Which is great. I, I mean, that's, you know, thank God, because in a way, that, that, that way they won't, you know, go up there with bulldozers one day, right? That's the one benefit. Uh -huh. um, the, other, the other problem is that the government hasn't actually recognized it as a national monument, as an, as an ancient site. Right. They still see it as a bunch of stones standing around. I mean, you can see how ludicrous that is. Yes. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's, yes. Imagine the British government saying, no, Stonehenge is just a bunch of stones. <laughs> it's, it's as bad as that. Yeah, you know, and, I see. And they've pretty much, I think, cut their, their contact with us now. They, oh. Something is going on. They, they don't like what we're doing. They don't like the fact that we're spreading this information. I'm not quite sure it's going on, but I don't like it. It's, I see. It's, it's a dangerous situation, and we've got to be very careful how we play it. I don't want to make an enemy of the government, but they need to talk to us. Well, okay. you know, it's um, all rock science to me at the moment. Yeah. It's just incredible. So there's phallus, phallus, phallus. Now, this is just spectacular. I mean, this, this particular one, when you hold it up, you can, you can get an idea what we're talking about. Here's another one. But they're hand-carved. These idea. are hand-carved. You see, now you can see how old it is. Remember, when you carve this, you, you remove the, the patina or the skin of the rock. And the, then the rock would look something like this, the raw, that were there. There you, got, there you got it, I mean there, okay, the black rock like here, inside of the rock, and this, that's the skin or the patina of the rock, and then once you've carved it, it starts to grow back, so this tells us, and this grows really slowly, the patina, so it tells us that this rock has been carved a long time ago for this patina to have grown back completely, and cover these palaces with a thick layer of patina, so this isn't something that was carved in the last few hundred years, this is thousands of years old. Now, immediately we're thrown into a big, you know, um, confusion because that's not what the history books tell us. This is not possible, <laughs> according to current history books. But, but where, how many years back are we actually going at this point? Well, at this point, based on our stone tools and our stone artifacts and uh, all the things that we've gathered, we're going back 300,000 years. You'll notice here, that the, the obsession with these pointed tools, these tools that come to a point, is so obvious, you know. And when you see this lying in a field on its own, it doesn't look like much. But when you start collecting them and you suddenly put them next to each other, you realize we're dealing with a different class of stone tool that has never been recognized before. This museum is just so full of anomalies and confusing things that it just boggles the mind. But I'm going to show you, this is the, one of the last things that I found, was this this here, what I call the Zimbabwe birds, or the birds, because these cultures were obsessed 
with discovering with with carving birds. First, we see it in Zimbabwe, the more refined Zimbabwean birds with the broad little belly and the base, and then the, the top going to the top. And here you've got an example of the base of the belly and going to the top. And there's always this little angle at the top here, the head looking at the sky. And that's quite incredible. So here we find the prototypes, the very early prototypes of these Zimbabwe birds. And in Zimbabwe, they become more refined. They get eyes and wings. They're just more recent or more refined. However, these could have also had eyes and wings. They, must just, they might have just eroded or peeled off because they're just a lot older. And then, um, as you'll see later today, we're going to go up the mountain. I'm going to show you some of the ruins there. On the way down from one of the ruins, I find these things lying in the forestry roads, just trucks driving over them. They're washing down the mountain into the road, and no one's paying attention to it. People just ignoring it. It breaks my heart. And um, it's to do with the protection of the gold miners. This is what it is. These were mascots, and the mascots and the protectors of the early gold miners. We see it in Egypt. In Egypt, much later, uh, many, many thousands of years later, we see the goddess Hathor being personified as a bird on a pedestal. And she was the goddess of gold mines and the goddess of gold miners, the protector of the gold miners. Oh, really? So the bird on the pedestal was often etched into the edges of the gold mines in Egypt and, and the Near East, the Middle East, going into the gold mines. And I'm finding the source of those birds on a pedestal in South Africa here with these very early rough prototypes and then the more refined Zimbabwe birds further north. And what about going into the gold mines themselves to look for, for these? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't, have you ever thought of going into those? Yeah, look, we've got quite a few gold mines that I've looked at. If you look at my new book, Temples of the African Gods, there's some photographs of these gold mines. And then there's some other gold mines that are, that are really deep that you need serious equipment to get out. That is a real expedition. Ah, you know, to go into dark caves is quite dangerous because there is a fungus that you pick up that is absolutely deadly and there's no antidote for it. So be careful, don't just go into caves because you may die. <laughs> it's like, really? it's, 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 you know, these are, these are all the things that you need to think about. <laughs> it's called, in Afrikaans, it's called Grotkoers. Grotkoers, it's a cave fever. I forget what the English uh, fun name for the fungus is, but it's, once you get that in your lungs, you're gone. This, this hollowed out stone, it looks like a crucible of sort, and you can clearly see the, the metallic sediment around the room. Um, now, we've, we've, uh, I've checked this, and this is iron. This is iron sediment. Okay. Okay, which is just... It can't be the accidental, in other words. Of course words. not. So somebody was smelting iron and using this as a crucible to create little molds, mm -hmm. ingots or whatever, out of iron. And this here is a spectacular artifact, because at first sight, all people just dismiss it. Ah, oh, this is just a... You know, just something to grind your, your maize in, or your corn, or whatever. And, uh, <clears throat> and then you look at, well, why would they put a spout here, or a funnel kind of thing? Mm -hmm. okay, and then you look closely at it, and you realize how badly eroded it is on the inside. If somebody's been using this until recently, it would have been very smooth. Ah, yes. Okay, so now you've got to use logic and a little bit of scientific thinking and extrapolation to say, okay, well... It obviously hasn't been used for a hell of a long time, and we're talking thousands and thousands of years, because this is hard granite. Yes. Okay, this doesn't erode easily. And it's eroded quite badly. It's rough on the inside. And then the spout, which is even rougher, and then you think, okay, wow. So obviously whatever, whatever they were doing in this was that important that they wanted to create a spout for it to pour it out. And then you step back and you notice, oh my goodness, look, there are marks here and marks there that tell us that this thing was suspended <laughs> in the air so that they could tilt it and pour out whatever was in it. Fascinating. So this is just a very important piece of equipment in ancient times and they, you know, to go to this amount of trouble, whatever they were doing in this was incredibly important. You're not going to go to this amount of trouble just because you want to crush a few, you know, a few millies. When you lift these up, they all all ring beautifully. But, um, and I, it's important to add here that Michael is a sound engineer. That's another one of his, his jobs. And, you know, has, his mother was an opera singer. So he's very oriented towards sound and sound te technology. 
So when he says they ring like bells, he, he's, he actually knows what he's talking about. Well, I'm going to show you now so that you don't call me a liar. <laughs> now these you find, okay, wow, this is interesting. And that's an interesting little statuette. But again, look at that, that very sharp, flat point as it was used for something. You get exactly the same here. Look how beautifully tapered this has been. And then when you pick it up, sometimes even the, your, your fingers suggest that... Yeah. Okay, but then, and then this one rings at a slightly different pitch. Okay, sounds now, like piano keys. Now when you ring them together, you hear the two frequencies um, harmonize together, or ring together. Can you hear? Yes. There's a clash. It's like playing two notes on the piano. Yes. This is what the rock looks like. It's black, oh. very homogenous. It's metamorphosized quartzite. It's known as hornfels. I see. And there you can see the patina, the skin of the rock. So this is a, this broke off because of heat. Okay. That's a very another very important indication and a clue. Whatever these guys were doing inside these ruins, they did not use fire. They did not use heat because this was cracked as a result of fire. And um, so this is a very homogeneous, 54% silica dioxide, so it's really, we're, talk, we're talking crystal, crystalline substances, hmm. quartz crystal, mixed with iron and aluminium, and a little bit of manganese. And with that, they've got very specific properties, and those properties are resonant frequencies, acoustic resonance. That's what this is all about. Okay, and I'm going to show you why I can say that. Then. <laughs> That's amazing. So, when I say they ring like bells, I'm not joking. If you close your eyes, it a, sounds a like church. a church bell, yeah. yeah. Look at all these, all the pictures, the aerial photographs that John Heiner has been taking for 20 years. And since I got involved, we've taken a lot more. But even just the ones that we've got here, all along. Each and every one is circular. Each and every one is unique. Okay? Yes. And they're very dense, as you can see. You flew over it the other day, oh. so you now have a very good idea how dense this stuff is. Yes. And it goes on and on and on. You know, it's, it's larger than Johannesburg, larger than Los Angeles, the, the, the area that it's Also, they're, they're each unique, which is very interesting. Okay, now, the reason they're unique the reason why they have this circular structure and yet they are unique is because it's like cymatics. The stones, imagine the stones are grain, grains of sand. It represents the sound frequency as it comes out of the earth at that spot. Each of the circles is connected to these channels.
This is the big ruin we call Blobosh Kral. It's fortunately has been preserved inside the Sapi forestry area. And uh, we have a good understanding with the Sapi people to under the Makamati Foundation. We have a clearing team and we help. We work with the Sapi people to keep them clean and keep them preserved. Um, so we can bring tourists here and show the people. Otherwise, they'll be completely overgrown and you wouldn't be able to enter. Um, I mean, this is all this has been cleared, as you can see recently. I see. Um, and so that you can have access. Otherwise, it, the grass is so tall and so thick, you can't even come through here. I see. Now, the interesting thing about this ruin is that this, this has got very strong links to the Hindu and the Davidians, like I mentioned earlier. It's one of the most difficult and complex ruins to try and explain. Later, I'll show you the one at the top of the mountain is a lot easier. But what's, what's interesting and quite confusing here is because it's been messed with so many times by passing cultures and passing civilizations that they've just rebuilt it and restructured it to their own needs and purposes. Uh -huh. So that's what is so confusing about it. So the poor archaeologists arrive here and they look at this and they don't really know. You've seen the extent of it from the airplane, from the helicopter. Well, not a single archaeologist that I know of in South Africa has seen it from a helicopter. They just don't know the full extent of it. They don't know that there are 10 million of these ruins in South Africa. They think there are a few hundred or a few thousand. Uh -huh. So they can't put it into context. Yes. So when they, make, when they you know, make what they call a detailed report, it's based on previously written historical books that they use as their springboard, and then they add their little bit to it. Well, that doesn't get us anywhere. The geologist that we flew over the ruins with. The um, Gerard Grunewald. And he, he's a senior, a senior geologist worldwide. I mean, as you heard, he's famous. He, was on, he discovered some dinosaur eggs. He was on National Geographic. And he became quite a controversial figure in South Africa and in the world because of his discoveries and his pronouncements. And he was proven right about uh, originally the d dinosaur egg. He was telling, oh, it's just a rock. And it was actually exactly. a, a, a real prehistoric. And you heard him say absolutely categorically. You know, at first he was a bit res reserved. And then by the time we took off and we flew over it in a helicopter, he turned around and he just looked at us and he said, this is no way, this is natural rock. This was brought here by people. This was built by humans. And this is mind-blowing stuff. And by the time we flew here, and we flew over this whole area here with those very dense visible settlements further up there from the helicopter. He just said, this is ridiculous. This is unbelievable. This is old. This is thousands and thousands of years old. This is not something that was thrown together a few hundred years ago. So currently, the history, history books, as written by the respected and official archaeologist, say that this ruin was built 200 to 300 years ago by the moving Bantu people from the north, a small family of 15 or 17 people. Okay, and then you've got to say to yourself, okay, guy, what drugs are you on? Okay, <laughs> really, just, just, okay, so they're migrating through here, and they just quickly built this. So let's just look at the statistics here, right? You can see it. When we go inside, you Incredible. realize yes. how much bigger it is. But let's, let me we, just give you some of the stats. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, so, first of all, I measured the circumference. It's about 100 meters in circumference. Okay. Then I didn't, took an average width of, of the wall, took an average height of the wall, what it would have been originally, and I worked out there's about half a million stones here. Okay. okay. Now, you're not going to have, uh, first of all, the stones are not from here. They come from the river all the way down the valley. Right. So a small family of migrating people of 15 to 17 people, just do the maths. They ain't going to build this in a lifetime. Yes. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> if they stay here for the rest of their lives, they're not going to build this. But this, unfortunately, because they archaeologists and they doctors and professors, that's what stands. And that's what goes into our history books. So along comes the next generation of archaeologists, and they refer to the stuff written previously, and they keep regurgitating the same bullshit. Yes. And that's what it is. It is so infuriating. I just want to slap these people and wake them up. So just come with me. Let me take you on a little journey of discovery, and let's think about this and apply some logic. And, and these, each individual stone is actually quite big and heavy. Well, they are. The average weight of these stones is about 20 kilos. Wow. You know, it's not, these are not small stones. That's, I'd say probably between about 10 and 30 kilos. That probably, some of, the, some of them are even heavier than that. Uh -huh. On the ruins at the top, even higher up, we got, we got stones that weigh a ton. Yeah. You know, we got stones that are like a ton. And then you go, okay, hold on. And then, well, it gets, the story gets even better, Kerry. 
<laughs> then they tell us, well, those ones up there were built by the women and children. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. This is just a very, one of those strange anomalies. There's a little circle with no entrance outside the big circle. Okay. Right. So you say to yourself, okay, well, who's going to build a circle of stones with no entrance for what purpose? And it's when you, when you, when you start realizing that the stones ring like bells. I mean, listen to that, you know. Mm -hmm. So what you've got in essence, you've got stones that are like the strings of a piano, wow. right? Now imagine if you create, this is a broken car. We're looking at a broken car, it doesn't work. You know, it's like, so people come in and say, well, if you say that this is a, an energy generator, show me, prove to me that it works. It's like me taking you to a scrapyard and telling you if you've never seen a car before and telling you, oh, those were used to be cars that used to drive on the road. <laughs> you say, oh, really? Well, prove it to me. <laughs> well, it's a broken car. You know, we don't even know what components went in there. But it it's certainly points to that. Yeah, now, interesting here's analogy. One of those, remember those pointed tools in the museum that I showed you? Well, here's yes. another one of those. Okay, look at this beautiful one. Yes. Okay. Now, this is clearly not an accident. Right. And once again, we got something that yeah. rings like a bell. Reddish color grows back the patina. I see. Original, when you break it, it's black like this. this oh, I see. Black That's the fresh, the and the red and is the patina. Eventually, the patina will grow back. The skin will grow back, so it looks like it never broke. The current research that I've got on patina growth on this particular patina tells us it takes between five and ten thousand years for this patina, or five, about, I think 5,000 years actually on this particular one, uh, for the patina, for the first microscopic layer of the patina to start forming. So now we're dealing with chunks of 5,000 years. Uh -huh. This is not something that happens, you know. So that's why when I show you a patina of two millimeters on a rock that's been manipulated, you know that that's, you know, 100,000 years plus. I'm beginning to believe that they use these pointed molded or shaped stones to focus and channel the energy just like a laser beam does in a or, or a crystal does in a laser beam. What is this part? What do you call it? Well the town is called Waterfallboven which is a Dutch word for upper waterfall or waterfall at the top and uh, then it's got a second half uh, Waterfall Onder which is a town just below the waterfall about uh, a drop of about 700 meters into the valley which is known as the low felt of the province of Mpumalanga in South Africa. He took me in a helicopter all over the ruins. Uh, I've been to Adam's calendar and seen the stones and, and felt their energy and this whole story is, is really going to break open very soon across the world I believe and you're going to have a lot more experts coming to you to talk to you about what's what's really going on here, which is really amazing. Well, thanks very much. At this stage, the experts have been very on the lean side. Uh, we've had to really look hard to find the so-called experts. Uh, but uh, it's interesting when we do find people that really are out-of-the-box thinkers in a professional capacity, whether they're archaeologists or geologists or astronomers, we get some absolutely mind-blowing information from them which always flies in the face of what the textbooks tell us and what is held very uh, dearly by the, the conservative establishment or the, the universities and the, the official uh, you know, educational institutions of South Africa about the history of South Africa and the, the origins of humankind and the things that we're dealing with here. Right. So you've, had, you've actually gotten emails from some of those academics that are... Um less than flattering, shall we say, towards your work. Yeah, it's very funny, you know, it's... Uh, when I have tried to reach out to the guys that are linked to the tertiary institutions, their response is very dismissive and very, um, uh, you know, looking down on us as if we are a lower class uh, citizen with, you know, we shouldn't be meddling in their <laughs> <laughs> and we shouldn't be meddling in their uh, special area of interest because they are the experts in this. And yet at the same time, they haven't studied our work. They haven't really looked at what we do or what we've discovered. And they haven't even been to many of these sites. And at the same time, they're prepared to go on record and make statements as uh, 
experts on our discoveries when they haven't had any knowledge or information about it themselves. Absolutely. Well, uh, it's, it's been a fascinating journey. I've been here for about a week now, and I have to say that uh, there's, there's so many ruins around here. It's just amazing that it's, it's gone undercover without discovery by the academics, by archaeologists, etc., to, to Adam's calendar itself, which is, is really a significant site. And uh, as you, and, and you could probably go into this here, the, face, the fact that it's on the 31st parallel and lines up with the uh, Great Pyramid in uh, Giza. And there's another site right on the way. What is it, that? Great, Great Zimbabwe ruins. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so the 31 East uh, longitudinal line is, seems to be very important in ancient civilizations here. And that's really interesting because uh, we've got, as you say, the... We've got Adam's calendar, um, great, uh, the great Zimbabwe ruins, and then we've got Napta Playa as well um, in southern Egypt, and then the Great Pyramid, all along the 31 degree east longitudinal line. Um, and as I mentioned last night in our presentation, uh, the numeric, you know, ancient languages had very specific structures, and they were structured, the alphabet was structured according to a power system and a numeric system of value that was given to each letter and the word L is or Elohim or L is actually the numeric value in Hebrew for that is 31 so I guess uh, they're trying to tell us that these were built by the gods of the Bible the Elohim of the Sumerian tablets and the Bible which I believe is the same the one and the same and as you already know I believe that they are the Anunnaki right absolutely and their number was 31 <laughs> okay. I, I do know that, that the pyramids themselves that are behind Adam's calendar in the distance that haven't been analyzed as pyramids, but for all intents and purposes, they do, do look like pyramids. It's actually uh, the pyramids that you're referring to, to, just to put into context for your viewers, is that Adam's calendar is aligned with the north, south, east, west uh, cardinal points of planet Earth. There is a three and a quarter degree deviation, which is something we can get to, which is really interesting because that suggests that Adam's calendar was built at some point in time in history where the alignment of planet Earth was different to what it is today, the axis of planet Earth. And well, the evidence is there. You can't, you know, scrape it under the carpet. There it is, three and a quarter degree deviation. Uh, but it's actually not the calendar itself. It's the, the pyramids that we believe are pyramids down in the valley that also align with Adam's calendar and the rise of Orion's belt um, with, along the three Orion's belt stones that you've seen. Um, the pyramids line up with that rise of Orion's belt further down in the valley. And it's actually the pyramids, what we believe are pyramids, that are along that 31 degree line. So it's the pyram Adam's pyramids, <laughs> uh, Great Zimbabwe ruins, Napta Playa ah, and the Great Pyramid of Giza that are all in this perfectly straight line. That line, however, does not run exactly parallel to the 31 degrees. It crosses slightly over, which once again suggests that there may have been some sort of a crustal displacement. Well, I assume that whoever built it didn't make mistakes. Okay, These guys in the past, they knew what they were doing. And if they wanted to put things in a straight line, they did. And they clearly put these structures in a very specifically straight line along the 31 degrees. But it crosses it over from uh, a few seconds to the west in the south to a few seconds to the east in the north in a straight line. I mean, other than the psychics that you've been talking to, right, and the channelers, other than that, you don't have any way to uh, document or prove the Anunnaki are behind all of this. Isn't that right? Other well, than Zachariah Sitchin <coughs> and is it the Sumerian tablets as well? Sumerian tablets, but also let's look at some of the interesting anomalies and indicators that give us information. Um, when we first saw the mounds at Adam's calendar and realized that they look like pyramids, um, we obviously, well specifically me, I started getting very interested in in them and realize that they must be pyramids because they just so 
completely out of play. You saw them yourself. Yes. Uh, and so I thought to myself, well, let's let's test this in some weird way. Uh, what what kind of tests can we apply to this? Now, um, and it was actually a group of psychics that I brought that were a humanities interest group that came from 24 different or 12 different countries from all over the world. I took them on a tour of Adam's calendar and one of them turned around and told me that the pyramids are on an extended golden mean spiral that starts at Adam's calendar. And as that person told me that information, it just came flooding in. And I knew exactly which two points we should use. And uh, I went and did that and we drew the golden mean spiral between the center of Adam's calendar, the two calendar stones, up to the stone altar, which I believe is the grave of Dumuzi. Okay. And you start that as the, the starting point of the golden mean spiral, and you start drawing it out, and guess where it ends? It ends right between the two hills that we think are pyramids. Uh -huh. Now, that is you know, just too, too much coincidence in that for me. Yeah. As we know, these ancient cultures and civilizations knew um, a great deal about the flow of energy, the Fibonacci sequence, the five factor, the 1.618, and all the, these golden mean spirals. And they structured, it seems to us now, the more research we do into Egyptology, into the other ancient sacred sites around the world, it seems that most of these sites have been structured along these golden mean spiral and the flow of energy channels. And time and time again, the psychics tell me things that are just really amazing. And and many of the things are, first of all, that Adam's calendar was built by Enki, or commissioned by Enki, um, that it was um, where humans were originally cloned, the human race, or the Lulu Amelu, and so forth. And then on top of it, uh, we had a ge geologist there at the site. By the time we took off in the helicopter and he saw it from the air, he just turned around at us and in a very excited voice said, there's no way this was natural formation. These stones were brought here by humans. These stones were put in the ground purposely for a specific reason to build a calendar by humans. That's it. And he, <laughs> he you know, he's, he risked his reputation great. by coming out as <laughs> bluntly as that. And that, I find that that's amazing. Right, uh, absolutely. And, and he's actually the second geologist that has done that. Okay. Um, the other geologist, uh, Peter Hobson, uh, is actually come on board with us into the Makamati Foundation as our uh, sort of in-house archaeologist. He's an archaeologist and a geologist. Wonderful. And you know, when you speak to Peter, uh, you, get a, <laughs> you get a completely different view of what's going on here than when you speak to an archaeologist or a geologist at university. And he's an out-of-the-box thinker. He's broadly read and informed. He understands the whole Anunnaki problem. So he's open to all these other suggestions. Wonderful. Uh, okay, so in terms of Adam's calendar and all these ruins, um, where do you go from, from here? You know? Well, there's so much work that we need to do. Uh, and that's really uh, uh, the only hurdle and any, everything, the only thing that's holding us back is funding. You know, the Makamati Foundation is at the moment run by Jan Heiner and myself. <laughs> Although, it's, you know, it's got a lot of members, but we're the guys that are keeping it alive and active because at the moment we're estimating based on previous scientific studies, which I'm not sure are very, very accurate. And that's all that we have in the world. That's what exists in the field of science for us to work with. Right. Okay. So, th you know, this is, these aren't easy things to deal with, Kerry, and that's what, that's what I find fascinating. People come in and say, well, have you done this? Have you done that? You know, when are you going to dig and why aren't you <laughs> excavating? And why haven't you gone and excavated the pyramids? And, yes. you know, and why haven't you dug there? And I go, whoa, we want to do all that stuff, but, you know, bring us the money and we'll do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Because we're in the middle of, of this ancient civilization and all these ruins everywhere. Yes. And, and it runs for about 100 kilometers that way, maybe even more and about 100 kilometers that way. So we're looking at 10,000 square kilometers. And it goes into, didn't you say it also goes into Zimbabwe? Well, it, you know, that's where you get the other pockets that are, that are very dense. We're sitting in one sort of, what I call, the, 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 one of the lost cities. Uh -huh. I found three of these lost cities. This is one of them. 
And the other one is is uh, between Rustenburg, where I come from, and um, and Botswana, all the way into Botswana, which includes the the famous uh, resort of Sun City and the Palace of the Lost City. <laughs> they built the Palace of the Lost City, which they thought was, was a fictitious name, on ancient stone <laughs> ruins. On a lost city. On a real lost city. They yeah. aren't even aware of it. Right. And uh, I recently did a presentation to the marketing director of, of Sun City, and they just they nearly fell on their back. They, they couldn't believe what I showed them. So there awesome. might be an interesting opportunity for the Sun International people to get involved in you know something, but you know they into they into tourism. I don't know if they into archaeology. There are several million of these stone circles, stone structures, circular stone structures in southern Africa, which includes Zimbabwe, Great Zimbabwe, and pretty much all of Zimbabwe is covered in these stone ruins as well. And that's why we can say there are millions of them. And if you start looking on Google. You're just going to fall on your back to see how widely these things cover. This and they're all in gold, in, in gold mining areas, isn't that right? Well, it seems like they were certainly used for the purpose of processing gold, gold ore, and getting gold or other minerals, probably also iron and copper and, and manganese and whatever else. But I think gold was obviously the, the primary metal and item they were looking for. And that's evident all over the place. And the fact that they're circular, and yet each one is completely different and completely unique, is very, very interesting. And that, that starts to ring very interesting alarm bells, because you say, well, why would each one be completely unique and completely different from the other stone circles? And that's when you start realizing, hold on, we're dealing with something else here. We're not dealing with you know, replicating a dwelling you know, a million times that looks exactly the same the way we would build houses today if we wanted to build cheap housing. <laughs> they yeah. didn't do that. Everyone was unique. Yeah, and it boggles the mind that, you know, what they might have been doing, like what really was going on here, it's just, um, it's pretty stunning. Certainly they, they were moving stones yeah. using some sound, and that's, that's similar to the Egyptian pyramids, as many people will, will recognize. But... It, it's, it seems to be more than that. Um, certainly there seem to be set up as, as possibly healing places. But what else was going on um, in terms of why would you need all these structures and were they actually living in them? Because that's the other issue. Because if they don't have entrances, what does it yeah. mean? What are they doing? That, that is the big mystery. We, we really, at this stage, I don't have an answer for that. Why are there no entrances in these original structures? Yeah. You'll see some entrances in the structures that have been reshaped in recent times by later civilizations that tribes arrived. Tribes going through. Tribes afterwards. coming through, seeing, finding the stone circles and saying, wow, great place, <laughs> we'll adapt it for our own needs. Right. So then you start seeing the, the emergence of, of entrances and so forth. But the original structures that have not been untouched clearly have no entrances and, and no doors and so forth. And, it really boggles the mind why, why that is so, and and that su suggests to me that they may not have been dwellings, but they were workplaces, and the walls therefore may not have been very high, but it's like you know like a, a fish tank, you know if you're doing something and you or you're leaching gold, if you go to the the mines today and they've got these these tanks that they leach the gold out of, they stand next to each other and they leach the gold with cyanide and sulfuric acid and all these different chemicals and the similar kind of thing is probably happening here so you, they don't have to be high walls if they had some sort of energy flowing through it that prevented the water from seeping out they could have been used and they could have just been chest height or, or maybe even lower or built into the ground filled with water and liquids and they could have been using those to separate the 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 crushed ore and extract the active ingredient, whatever that active ingredient was, whether it was gold or iron or anything else. And that's really what has been shown very clearly by a wonderful uh, Zimbabwean geologist, Anne Kritzinger, at uh, the Zimbabwe University, who shows without a shadow of doubt that these so-called slave pits or animal pits, these circular structures, were flotation extraction tanks for gold. And it's very, very obvious from her research. So. That is a very strong bit of supporting evidence that we're dealing with an ancient vanished civilization that we have mining gold. Yeah.
the mystery of all these stone structures and why are they certain shapes and why they have no entrances, that is just a phenomenal mystery. Uh, I believe that it was the sound that were, they were getting from the earth and amplifying that with the certain structures that they created on top of the, the surface. And then, as you said, these channels, each one of these original circles had these channels coming into it. Each circle was linked by this channel. And that's spectacular when you see some of these architecture, uh, these archaeological drawings of our, you know, forgive me, our ignorant archaeologists, because they come here and they draw these things, they study them for a week. That's, I think, the longest they've ever spent here <laughs> studying these things. And they give us these beautiful you know, drawings of these circular stone cir structures and and they show you that each one of them is linked by like a, you know, like a, a like a bunch of grapes. Yes. Each one is linked by a stem to a main artery and a main channel and then that links over there, that's linked to a bunch of them yes. over there, then it goes over there and it's linked. Everyone is linked without entrances and they're all linked together. So you start realizing they're like these channels that link them all together are like wires like wires that connect all these stone circles together and then you get those beautiful ones with the with the concentric circles going out like three concentric walls and a whole huge area of those that have been mapped by these archaeologists yeah. clearly uh, clearly we're dealing with some sort of a, a generation of energy and the channeling of energy down all these these channels to use for my guess is for every and any purpose imaginable in terms of the Anunnaki themselves, because you wrote Slave Species of God, right? And it's God with a little g, right? That's yeah, very, God, very and, uh, important. Very important. Slave Species of God, God with a little g, to make very clear for people and d differentiate God with a big g from God with a little g, and the twain shall never meet. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe someday, yeah. you know. Well, well, not in the way that we've been, we've been sort of led to believe, right? Sure. Uh, but so, but I have to say, because, you know, of course, Camelot has special interest in the Anunnaki as possibly still being here on Earth and uh, backing up the Illuminati and so on and so forth. So what we have here is a really interesting find that relates to all of that. And, I mean, for example, have you ever been in touch with Sitchin? Is he aware of this? Well, I hope that by now Sitchin is aware of this. Uh, I've never been in touch with him. I'd love to bring him down here and show him what it is that he started, because I think it's really his his translation and his volumes of work that really got people interested in in Anunnaki and their their, their quest for gold and their large gold uh, you know gold mines and gold settlements that they created in the deep Abzu. And I also want to clarify this, okay, because okay. there's a lot of confusion about this thing called the Abzu and where is the Abzu and people will tell you it's in the Middle East or it's in India or it's in, in Ethiopia and it's, no one's, very few people have ever suggested that the deep or the Abzu and especially the deep Abzu is in Southern Africa. Some people have suggested that, suggested that but there, I think there's a lot of resistance to that. Like there has been forever the resistance that anything of value could have come out of Southern Africa. I mean, that's been going on for thousands of years, or for a long, long time. Huh. Okay? Okay. Because we're dealing with King Solomon's mines, you know, where's the land of Ophir? Well, if we compare the land of Ophir and the land of Abzu, and we start drawing, just being, let's try and be logical about this, and, and apply chronological steps of logic and and rational thinking so if if this place called Abzu is where most of the gold in human history has come from yes then clearly we're sitting on top of it right now because you've seen it this is the place where almost <laughs> of the gold comes from and it's still coming from it's right? still coming from here today yes. most of the gold in the world from southern Africa and if people don't know that, then they they clearly <laughs> misinformed, and 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 this has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. So if we're going to try and find the Abzu by process of elimination, then let's find the place where most of the gold in human history has come from. This is clearly the place. We're sitting right in the middle of it. You flew over it. You saw the vastness of it. It is truly 
breathtaking and spectacular. It doesn't end. You just think it's like this rolling hills of more ruins and more terraces and more of these channels and link them all together. Right, absolutely. So, uh, so this must be the Abzu because this is clearly the largest settlement of its kind anywhere on earth and was all around the mining of gold. What I had was also that there's stone under there. So I had a very strong sensation that uh, this was also possibly a time travel device that when it was all the stones were uh, upright and it was operating that it was in essence probably doing the same things or very similar things to what Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid are doing. Um, and I think perhaps you've had that same information or feeling about it. Yeah, definitely. The, well, we know already that the stones are chosen. In all the millions of, uh, millions of stone ruins we have here, the stones have been chosen very specifically for their acoustic properties and their harmonic resonant properties and the acoustic, the way they ring like bells. And you heard that last night at the, at the presentation, you know, when I ring that bell, that, that one stone, <laughs> oh, the whole audience the whole goes, audience oh, goes. <laughs> they gasp, you know, they really can't believe it. Yes. And, and it's not just one stone, they all ring like that. Yes. If you know, you know, you put them in a specific way and hold it, obviously if you hold it the wrong way, you'll deaden, you know, muffle the sound, but if you hold it, bang, and it rings beautifully. Okay, and there's also the premise that the ankh was uh, is native to southern Africa and that is uh, there's evidence from I think even one of my other interviews in which they talk about the onk the use of the onk for directing sound energy uh, so that was its original intention is my understanding that's what that's my current that's what my current research tells me you know where this is going to go I think it's probably going to give it, we're going to find out a lot more but currently, it seems that the Ankh is a very important tool in all of human history for the generation of specific frequencies, for use in all different areas of, of human you know, um, activities, from generating frequencies for healing, generating frequencies for creating standing waves in stone circles of a specific frequency that you can then convert to another frequency, with these sacred stones with the holes in them and and the Ankh I think played a very key central role in being the like the tuning fork and a starting vibrational frequency to kick start this whole operation here and also for healing for in Egypt you see it often in in situations someone holding it up yes. to your, to your face to your possibly to your pineal gland or something which suggests they might have been Focusing the vibrational frequency, sound frequencies into your head and activating your pineal gland or doing something of that, that nature or healing. It, I think it's, we're probably dealing with, with all of the above. Right, and there, there, I think there's a link between the Ankh, the symbol of the Ankh, which is in, also in Egypt talked about being a symbol for eternal life, and the notion of sound of, of being a tuning fork for sound because yes. the link up between eternal life and sound you're starting to graze the surface it seems to me um, and the potential here is, is really huge yeah. um, I'm amazed that the you know and I'm, I'm probably it's a semi good thing that the African government hasn't leached onto this because um, if they know knew what they really had here uh, perhaps they would try to hide it from the people even more so it's you know it's lost on the hillsides um, if, it were, if it weren't for you and Johann Heiner, who is a pilot flying over these ruins, uh, they simply would stay in obscurity, is, is the point, right? Yeah, and I think it's, you know, <clears throat> what, what's important to also recognize is that these kind of discoveries and the conclusions we reach don't happen quickly. They don't happen overnight, and I think having been here for about a week now, you're starting to realize <laughs> How difficult it is to get around and get to these sites. They're not sometimes, though especially the ones that you've discussed. Okay, we're going to study this site here. Well, the, the the site that we've done most of the work on is right on the edge of that mountain, right behind us. Yeah. Now to get there is not easy. I understand. Okay. Yeah. And you're going to get there. You got to clear the site, chop down the invasive trees, clear the grass so you can get inside and then start doing your research. Right. And these things take time. And and 
in one of these processes, we accidentally started moving some of the stones that were lying around, and we and I heard them from a distance, and they were ringing like bells, and making beautiful sounds, and it was that moment that that changed everything for me, and from that moment, our whole oh, my particular theory on this started moving towards sound frequency as a source of energy and a tool that was used by these civilizations and then suddenly you look at Egypt and the pyramids and that they were sound energy generating devices that suddenly comes out of nowhere hits me in the face <laughs> and the fact that the stones at Stonehenge were chosen for their sound acoustic properties I've never heard that before until I went to Stonehenge you know uh, six weeks ago that was exposed to me by this lady that's been doing a lot of work on Stonehenge and she's a really eccentric out-of-the-box thinker and she's got incredible knowledge and information about the energy flow in the stones of Stonehenge for example that there are these bands of energy that come out of the stones of Stonehenge she shows you with a, a divining rod how it affects the divining rod as you move it up the stones at Stonehenge clearly there's a lot of energy flow we've seen it with the grass yes yeah so there's no difference yeah absolutely and different stones have different energies and the whole thing so so there's really a, an amazing uh, discovery here, but also a, a continuing mystery. Continuing mystery, a lot of research we need to do. Absolutely, and I, I think ground penetrating radar would be really awesome to bring to the site. Ground penetrating radar will be absolutely crucial. Well, Michael, uh, this is great, and because it's becoming cold, the sun goes down in, like yep. that, like a stone, and we're gonna have to move to the next location. Yeah. But let's continue this elsewhere. Cool. We're here at this amazing ruin that I've just been shooting all over the place. It's the largest ruin, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it is the largest one we have found so far. I trust there probably be larger ones, but this one is at the moment, it's about 150 meters across and you've just walked through it so you get a sense of it and you've been attacked by energy forces all over the place <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah it's it's fascinating and it's just it's right on top of the mountain it's one of the highest ruins we've got um, and it is mysterious there was a lot of stuff going on here there's a lot of ringing rocks everywhere um, that big square rock that I've played on the other side on top of the hill yeah. It's, it's like a xylophone. It's, it's spe amazing. It's spectacular. It's so crystalline. So we're going to make a transition here, and we're going to talk about this other idea that you have, because I'm sure there's a link-up between what you're doing now and the fact that this idea came to you on how to reorganize, really, society economically. I realized that, that the, the way the world is right now, uh, there is no happy ending. There is no happy outcome. The financial woes, the problems that we have, it's only going to get worse. And we, you know, what do we do? Are we going to carry, stay on this train until it crashes completely? Or are we going to be intelligent and use our brains to come to stop ourselves and say, well, what do we do about this? We can't continue on this economic policy and this thing called capitalism when we know that it's clearly going to crash. So about five years ago, just shortly after I wrote Slave Species of God, I realized that we're heading for this, and, and I started researching a new social structure, and a social structure that is based on the concept of no money. And the reason I say that is because we know, and we constantly remind it, that money is the root of all evil, and the love of money is the root of all evil, and all the woes on earth are there because people work themselves into the grave and they work their fingers to the bones for what for money now what the hell is this all about you get born and from the moment you take your first breath to the last breath you breathe out it's all about money something is wrong with this equation so I call this new social structure that I've come up with contributionism and the reason it's called contributionism is because it takes societies and and small smaller societies and it allows people to contribute their natural abilities, their natural talents, or what they've been trained to do to the greater benefit of all in the community. And you remove all any form of money and you prevent any kind of barter or trade because barter or trade eventually leads to he who has more to trade will rule the roost. So you can't go back to barter or trade because it's just another form of money and 
also remove any kind of attachment of value to material things because material things are just you know they're just transient momentary things in our lives we accumulate so much rubbish and then we discard it we can keep discarding the stuff we accumulate so how can we attach any value to it we keep buying new cars and suddenly the new car that was so valuable to you last year is now suddenly not valuable at all and you want something else it's got a lot more value to you so this value thing is a is an, a consequence of capitalism and consumerism and if we're going to get out of this trap and this dead-end crash we need to move on to a completely different track that we've never tried as the human race and that you know that is really very important to understand many people when you when they first find out about this contributionist thing they say oh it's like communism or it's like socialism i say no it's it's nothing like that it's unlike anything else that humanity has ever done because no way ever have we removed money from the system right well what it what it seems to be and, and correct me if i'm wrong but it seems to be where people are contributing the love and the passion that they have to the society so that if you you know you explore and you realize as we have done that you know you have a passion for something as you have a passion for uh, discovering these ancient sites uh, and that becomes your skill set and then on top of it you also are going to have people that maybe for two hours a day or something do some kind of you know maybe more menial job to contribute to the to the sort of workings of the society is that right yeah and the, look it, this is not a simple thing that can be explained in five minutes it takes quite a while to unpack it and unpack the different fundamental blocks and the cornerstones of contributionism it in its in its entirety it's very simple but we need to completely change our way of thinking a totally paradigm shift in our thinking because um, it's we're not used to it and it comes as a shock to the system you know people instinctively try and resist it well how are we gonna pay for this and how are we gonna afford that and how we I say remember there's no money you don't have to pay for anything everything is available to everyone everything is available for free because everybody does what they love to do and are choose to do and are good at doing are passionate about doing they do that for as their contribution hence contributionism to the greater benefit of all in the community now that's that's sounds very simple but for capitalists and we are all capitalists because we brought up in the capitalistic system some people struggle with that first little hurdle the moment you get over it things become so easy and so simple to understand so you need to unpack what are the, the, the fundamental cornerstones of this well it's pretty much the same cornerstones as we have in society today food water shelter health education um security legal structures arts culture and so we go so if you start with those fundamental cornerstones and you start analyzing how is contributionism going to affect the supply of food and very quickly you realize that when say 10 percent of the global population get involved in the production and the supply of food because you'll be surprised how many people actually love doing that in any case they like to work with land and farming and planting stuff and growing food and growing that and and farm and you know cattle and crop and agriculture in its entirety if 10 percent of the global population are developing and providing food when they get everything given to them to help them do that what becomes very clear and very evident is the abundance of this of the supply and of food how much food there is it becomes abundant and the same goes for every other area in science in you know free energy the fact that there's no money the first consequence and the first casualty of a society without money is crime crime virtually vanishes overnight because pretty much all of crime today is committed because of money the acquisition of wealth and power right so if you remove money from the system crime virtually just melts away and disappears and then you have obviously the crime of fashion and crime of of insanity and maybe areas like that but even if you break this down and you step out of the 
the box and you look at it from the outside, you realize that especially crimes of passion are still most of the time somehow linked to money or, or greed or envy or jealousy because your you know, girlfriend's run up with some guy who's got a bigger car or more money. <laughs> you know. Well, it's a have, have not uh, sort of paradigm that people have. In other words, they, they, they have something or they lack something, so they go and steal it or they go and, you know, kill for it or whatever it is. So, but we're talking also about something that 2012 is going to facilitate. And, and in some ways, that's really um, my interest in it because it, it appears through some kind of serendipity that not only are you discovering in these ruins the, 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 uh, what appears to be sound technology that is used to, for healing and also um, all sorts of things, including uh, this magnetron, right? So you have, you have the ability to change the world around you using this technology, which is very sophisticated, but, but we don't have at our disposal at the moment, although the secret government, I'm sure, is using it. But it's, it's, it's a tribal system with a difference. Yeah. And, and this is why I think Africa is a perfect place here, especially in South Africa, because we got the beautiful blend between the haves and the have-nots, the really extremely wealthy and the extremely poor. And um, and it's it's the inequality is very obvious. Here, yeah, you know, I, so it's very glaring. So in some ways, I, I guess your premise is that perhaps this this place that allowed um, Nelson Mandela, for for in, for instance, to change the social order for all intents and purposes in this place um, in a historical way, si in a similar way, possibly the ground is laid here. We can take it to the next level now. Um, because, you know, if you look at the Constitution and you look at the human rights, the fundamental human rights, basically what has happened is that the politicians have stolen the country from its people. It's as simple as that. And I don't, don't think it takes a genius to figure that out. Everybody knows this. All your listeners and your viewers will know this. The land belongs to its people. Therefore, the minerals in the ground belong to its people. The water belongs to its people. The trees that grow on the ground belongs to its people. The government are officials that have been put into, into management position by the people to do the best they can for the people. The land, in essence, what's happened is that the politicians have stolen the land from its people. Where the hell does that come from? Who came up with that idea? Well, we know who came up with that idea, the bloody Illuminati. But we need to take that back and notify the people of their fundamental rights. The stuff belongs to you. The stuff belongs to everyone, not a few greedy corporations that have laid claim to it. It belongs to the people. Now, from that premise, we can start building the foundation of a contributionist society. If everything belongs to the people, then there's this incredible wealth of, a, of abundance. If tomorrow morning everybody woke up and did whatever it is that they were doing without expecting payment, one could very, I'm not say, saying this is the way to do it, but I'm just giving you a, a, another strange hypothetical thing to think about. If everybody woke up and did what they were, they, were, they were doing, from the mining industry to everything, and then at the end of the month, they were just allowed to have as much food as they needed, or every day, as much food as they needed, as, as much electricity as they needed, as much water as they needed, to make them, give them abundance and make them happy, and keep them alive, and their children alive, and suddenly their children could go to university because they don't have to pay for the university because it's free for everybody one can very quickly tran you know, uh, transform the society into a whole new kind of contribution of society that's not how I suggest we do it however there's another way to do it and that is really by I believe the way to do this is to take small communities and I don't mean ostracized communities that a lot of people around the world are doing setting up these little lager communities behind you know on large farms and they self-sustain right. they got everything for themselves and, and exclude everybody else you got to take existing towns and existing communities and make give them take them off the grid and give them everything for free including food and and small towns are capable of doing that you, well, you're talking also about a, a communal garden, right, and a communal, you said, eating halls and places, so that these things are available, in other words, and the other thing is that, that it generates, in other words, depending on the numbers of people that you gather together and, the, and the, I guess, the wealth of any particular area, in other words, here in your town you have 
uh, running water, and so that you can put, uh, you said, like um, a device into the running water that would would basically generate free energy. Yeah. Um, to power the you know the light bulbs in the house and so on and so forth, um, and some fr from there it's it's actually about working together at, rather than working in competition with each other. Exactly. Uh, you got to work together, and if you look at the mineral wealth of the country, the water, the resources, the farming community. If the farmers farm and provide food, if the miners mine and provide the, the, the elements that we need, the minerals, remember that when you take money out of the system, people aren't going to mine minerals to trade with them. So we're not going to need that much mining and we're not going to mine gold and all this stuff because we want to sell it to somebody who's got a lot of money. So that's going to come down to a bare minimum. But not only that, what contributionism does, it provides a fertile ground for new technology to surface and all the free energy that's been suppressed by the Illuminati and the control of money suddenly has a very fertile ground to start coming out and we start seeing sprouting new energy ideas and scientists and inventors everywhere that are going to bring abundance of different types of free energy in all forms that we can't even imagine right now. Right. I'm having trouble, you know, staying awake. In this ruins. Well, so while we quickly digress, I want you to say the effect that these ruins have had on you. Um, it's just that there's very powerful energy here, and it's very relaxing. Uh, that's all I know how to talk about it. I mean, it's it's actually kind of putting me to sleep, and and so, you know, I I feel like you know I'm just sort of melting into the stones, so to speak. Um, there's something going on here energetically, and it's not a negative thing. <laughs> You know, but but it's probably um, you know affecting the interview to some degree. The energy is very powerful. Well, bzz, we're going to put all the positive energy into this tape, into the interview. So when people watch this, they pick up the same energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, each each spot is a little different, you know, and we've come to a little bit, you know, the different spot here, and um, it well, comes up from the rocks. You see. Well, you know already from what we've discussed before that you've got recorded is that. We know that these stone ruins are alive. As soon as we figure out how to convert this into useful energy, and maybe um, maybe Dan Burish uh, will step up to the plate and help us with this because he might have information or knowledge and technology to help us convert this. If he can't, we'll find someone out there. We have discovered free energy right here. We're sitting in it. Yes. It's in a, and it never stops. It's free and it's ongoing. And, so we, and we have millions of them. <laughs> but it, it's really fascinating. I, I just have to get back to this sort of the idea that you're coming up with a, 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 a sort of a model for society that will not in, that's really based on, in a sense, free energy. Yeah. Because that's kind of the root of it. In other words, I think you know when we become more and more in tune with the fact that all we are is energy anyway, then we're just talking about transmuting energy from one place to another, to one form to another. And in essence, that's what they seem to have tapped into here with, this, with the placement of the stones, with the nature of the stones, uh, with the use of sound, sound technology for moving the stones. To come back to what you said about the Anunnaki and having also to live here among these stone ruins, they had, they, this, was, this is leading edge technology. I mean, you know, you got to go a long way. You got to transcend into a spiritual realm from this physical realm, or what we believe to be a physical realm, to a spiritual realm to move to another kind of technology. You know, you've got to go to, to the Merkaba technology from here. It's like the next leap from here, in my opinion. You go from, this is the sort of leading edge, stone age, physical material technology on planet Earth using sound and frequency in very simplistic ways, playing with the conversion from one frequency to the next, which will include the ex extraction of me me uh, metals and minerals from the ore and using it for all kinds of things. And, uh, and then moving from this technology to the next step would be the Merkaba, where you don't need physical material in that, where you just surround yourself with light and you travel through space-time and time-space, right? Well, so, I mean, but there's also the sense that it's, this could be a time machine. Yeah, uh, it, that, or, that, or, that creates a Merkaba. Yes, yeah. or a transportation device of some yeah. kind. In other words, it, I mean, you know, just sort of playing with the idea, but it's possible that we're talking about a civilization that wanted to communicate with back to Nibiru yeah. uh, and and maybe 
there was something going on here in terms of communication and the generation of energy which would send information back and forth between the planets. Um, it's an amazing thing. I'm, you know, I'm sitting here with you and right now my right foot I'm, is, is placed on a stone and the stone is so powerful that my, my foot is vibrating. I, 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 it's like I feel that energy and I'm wondering also, you see, we don't know what we've got here and this could be activating our DNA. Yeah. It could be, you know, I mean, maybe humanity blew them away at that point. Maybe they lost control of them at that point. That is a very important thing that you brought up. I write about that in Slave Species of God, where I suggest that the, the way the Anunnaki lost control of the human race was they didn't count on the rapid evolution of our DNA. And I believe you just put your finger right into the problem that the energy in these <laughs> stone ruins that they made them create actually enhanced and speeded up the evolution of the human DNA, which they expected to evolve a lot slower, but yes. this was the catalyst. Yes. I really feel that there's some important information in there and some elements of truth and, and signs that we don't yet understand. But I think we're starting to get more and more of that information about the DNA and what we know about it, that it's a receptor and transmitter and information and light and, and, it, and certain lights and frequent. Well, what is light? Light is a frequency. So light, certain frequencies activate and speed up the activation of the genes in our DNA and so forth. So this is all linked together. So, so we may be getting smarter by the minute here. <laughs> well, I can see, since we sat down, you're about 10 years younger. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, but you know what? Um, just to come back to this mining thing, and, and nothing has changed, okay? If you look, if you go into the mines today, who's doing all the, the, the hard labor? It's the poorest of the poor. They take them from the rural areas, they promise them a, 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 a life and promise them money that they can come and earn and send back to their families that live in the rural areas in the bush. So these guys come out of the bush and they get trained to be mine workers and they go underground, they work in the mines. What, what happens? They get trained to use advanced technology that to them is very advanced technology. They get shown how to use you know, pneumatic drills and other advanced technology by pushing buttons and driving these tra tractors and using, you know, sure. all these things. They don't know where that technology comes from. They just know how to use it. If you had to stop that technology and ask those mine workers, well, build me th these things, or do you think they'd be able to build it? Of course not. They just know how to use it. That's exactly what is going on here. Well, I think that there's also another clue going on here, which is if the Anunnaki came here and they created, ultimately they were mining gold. They came to the planet to mine gold. That's the premise. Well, what you're talking about is a culture, the Anunnaki, who know about mining. In other words, they they know how to go to planets, determine what you know what the ores and 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 and, and uh, elements and, and gemstones and whatever they whatever's in the earth. And of course, earth is very rich, and, and to this day, it's very rich. Of course, it's and very I, rich. And I have whistleblowers that are telling me there's that gold to this day is being taken off the planet. Okay, um, at this very time, by the same Anunnaki who came here originally. And so what you have to look at the situation and you have to say they would naturally investigate the nature of the stones to begin with. So, so they would tap into the fact that the amount of silica in each of these stones, in other words, gold is one kind of a resource, but these stones are actually another kind of resource. This, and they, w they may know this from their own planet, right? Exactly. And the, as you know, they chose all these stones specifically. I would have already pointed out in my presentations and to use that all the ruins were originally built from the same stone, exactly the same stone and that we sit in. And the stone is not indigenous to this place, is that not right? Not necessarily. Well, it's indigenous to the to the part of the, the continent, okay. but it's not necessarily indigenous to where the ruins are. Like here? Like here. Here the stone was brought from down at the bottom in the valleys near the river, brought up to the top of the mountain. And as you and know... How? You know... How would you... These, these are massively heavy stones. Exactly. So they must have had... I guess they had, you know, the levitation technology with sound. They went down to the bottom. They picked up a big pile of these rocks. They brought them up to the top of the mountain, psh, dumped them here. Then they activated the energy coming out of planet Earth, mm -hmm. okay, and allowed the stones to find to their place. Find their place in in accordance to the energy fields, like in cymatics, the shape of 
the sound frequency coming out of the earth. Now you've created a plug point for the energy coming out of the earth. Now if you activate these stones that ring like bells and they're full of silica dioxide and they good conductive properties because of the iron as well. Um, uh, now you've got a very complex energy generating device. But what I find fascinating is you brought that up, uh, we spoke about this before, is, is the, the terraces. You know, today, in modern mining today, you don't see farmers building terraces, right? It just doesn't happen. They plow the lands, they plow large, large tracts of lands and fields, and they plant the millies, the maize, they plant the corn and the wheat and everything, and then they harvest it, right? Well, these guys, did, they had the same land available to them, but they chose not to do that. They chose to build very intricate terraces for thousands of miles of terraces to plant food. Now, isn't that a bit wacky? <laughs> you know, the only reason you'd want to do that is if you knew that you had the energy to channel through the walls of the terraces, just like you channel the energy through the walls of these ruins, from ruin to ruin, so you channel the energy through your, your agricultural terraces to um, maximize the growth and speed up the growth of the produce that you're growing. And now you're dealing with really advanced knowledge and culture that we've only discovered recently. And we know the incredible effect sound has on the growth of plants and yes. certain other frequencies and even thought patterns that have on the growth of plants. You know, the thought of going into a room and cutting a plant sends the plant into shock. <laughs> so. Right. Uh, well, the terraces idea is, is really uh, a mystery, right? Because uh, I, now I don't know anything about the Bantu people, but my understanding is that I, I'm thinking they're nomadic. Well, the, they, they arrived, we, we're told that they arrived from the north, northwest Africa. And they might, northwest and northeast Africa. They migrated their way down into southern Africa and then they settled here around, eventually settling here around three, four hundred years ago. And maybe not even that far back. So they were, they were moving down from Africa all the way down for 2,000 years or about 1,700 years. Okay, that's, that's what we get told. Well, that's not what these stone ruins tell us. Okay, they tell us a completely different story. That this was a, a densely populated part of the world with high knowledge, high technology. We see all the, all the symbols and symbolism and artifacts that are used in Egypt and Sumeria and other parts of the world that originate here. From the Ankh to the Sphinx to the Horus Stone to the wheel to the cross, the, the cross in a circle. All these things that originate here. And that sends shockwaves through some people because they just can't wrap their heads around that. Right. Uh, well, they're also, I mean, we're talking 300,000 years. Isn't that what you basically, the, it, that's the ballpark dating of, the, of that, the... That's the ballpark dating done by geneticists when they say that, you know, according to the mitochondrial Eve, the first humans appeared on Earth between 170 and 300,000 years ago. And, and if you read, um, if you read uh, Muriel's, uh, Uriel's machine, you'll get that information in that book. And, uh, and but the stones themselves, I mean, these stone walls and, the, and, the, and Adam's calendar, is it dated actually to that point or, or earlier? Well, these ruins here are dated based on my current belief and putting together pieces of the elements and the pieces of the puzzle together to about 285, 300,000 years ago. Then that gets confirmed with my channeling and my the psychics that have confirmed some of it. And then... That little rock over there that I showed you with a patina on it and the tools and the carved artifacts that we find with a patina has regrown beautifully that suggests these things are not young. These things have been around for a long, long time. So, uh, but you're saying the Bantu people came when? Well, that's, nobody really knows, okay. you know what I mean? That really is an open-ended question. Um, at this stage, it looks like they only arrived here about 300 years ago, three, 400 years ago. Not I mean, that's a very short time in, in, what, in the span of what we're talking about and then uh, these, you know, these ruins that have been virtually ignored by the, the, the South African government. Isn't that exactly. True? So you see, because they don't know about the, the, full, the full true history, they ascribe all this to the Bantu people. And, and that's just not possible. There just weren't enough people to build 10 million ruins. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> not going to happen. Yeah. So we're dealing with, with an, uh, you know, a large number of people that lived here for extended periods of time. Let's just look at the, the agricultural terraces, right? You've seen a lot of it from the air. 
and already you're overwhelmed and blown away by the vastness of it right now you're not going to build so many terraces if you're feeding you know a thousand people <laughs> you know you're going to be building this many terraces if you're feeding millions feeding millions of people right so you've got to use logic in these things and sometimes logic is the last thing that our historians and our archaeologists apply in these in these um, puzzles okay so but to get back to to contributionism because it's really bizarre how these two things seem to be interacting with each other and you know I can't even imagine where this is all going you know what I mean uh, in other words we're really headed into the unknown not only with these stone ruins that have not been discovered except by you and and Johann Heiner and maybe a few other people who have been aware of them let's assume because you know how could they be here for all of this time and never never be talked about um, and yet where is it all going? I mean, you know, if you, if you wanted to wrap, you know, wrap this whole thing up that we've been doing and the, the overall landscape that we've covered, it, you know, what, what would you say to all of that? I think it's heading into the age of enlightenment and consciousness without a shadow of doubt. Uh, as we're sitting here, our DNA is being enlightened. <laughs> we are able to think more clearly and, uh, Obviously, this is a huge wave sweeping the world. Consciousness is exploding around the world. I believe that the, the flow of energy, the different vibrational frequencies that activate our DNA and our, and our pineal gland are directly responsible for that. I believe these ruins have a very important role to play with it or in it. And I believe that there's only one way out. And five years ago, I reached that conclusion. And I believe contributionism is it. You know, anything other than, or anything that continues on the track of capitalism, or the use of money, or any barter, or trade, or kind of exchange system, it cannot work. You've got to have a system where people, and a social structure where people do what they're passionate about, and what they choose to contribute to the society, what they're good at. When they wake up in the morning, they do it with a smile on their face, and they're only too happy to do that. And you find that with people, when they get into a job by by choice or by accident, mostly by accident when people get into a life where they love what they do, they're the happy ones. Mm -hmm. The ones that have a job, they're the unhappy ones. True. And that's just the rule of, of this planet at the moment. So it's leading towards contributionism where people contribute. And you can't force a rocket scientist to grow vegetables. You know, so all these, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I know about the Venus Project and all these other things that are going on there. And when I looked at all those projects, I find fundamental structural problems uh, with them. And, I, you know, God bless them that they're doing it. But I believe that we need to maybe, I want them to have a look at what I'm talking about here. Um, because you've got it, you can't force people to move into little secluded communities and then let everybody, oh, let everybody plant a little vegetable garden in their backyard. No, that's the wrong model, okay? Because rocket scientists don't know, and they don't like to plant vegetables. They want to build rockets, <laughs> right? And shoemakers don't want to plant vegetables. They want to make shoes and design sports shoes. And, and you know, and, and, and uh, civil engineers want to design beautiful cities and things. And, you know, and, and so it goes, you know. And that's how it's got to be. Okay. And in the end, it seems that it's all about the use of energy, and it's also our relationship to energy that we have to change. Where these, these ruins become something of a jumping off point, I think, um, mentally and, and in terms of consciousness, because if your mind can begin to wrap around the notion of these amazing ruins and how these stones got here, then you're talking about the use of energy in ways that we've never dreamed. So, uh, as you said, we don't even understand the use or how to use sound energy and sound frequency. We, we only really come to terms with it. I guess it may be some of the Black Ops projects and those guys have gone a long way ahead and they really get it, but it hasn't filtered through to the masses and it's up to people like us to make the mainstream of the global population realize that it's there for us to use. We're sitting in it. We know that these things are alive. In fact, the guy that just phoned me now was the guy that measured all the energy in here ah. that interrupted us. I mean, our thing is actually interesting. We're talking about the sound frequency yes. and the sound energy, and Andres phones me to interrupt our interview. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> well, maybe you should take the call. You know? <laughs>
Um, but at any rate, um, Michael Kellinger, thank you very much. It, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me as your guest. You've been a wonderful host. I said you were responsible for everything but the weather. I have to say one other thing that you didn't, I didn't see any lions, but I, you know, I felt their energy. <laughs> but I, I, I thank you for this experience and um, you know, I will always treasure it. And I think it's, it's really something that a lot of people would love to experience. Well, thank you very much, Kerry. I am honored that you graced us with your presence, that you <laughs> took the time and, and raised the money from your funders and your donors. So thank you for all those people that contributed towards <laughs> Kerry being able to come here and have a look at what we've got here and the origins of humankind and these new areas that we're just starting to scratch, peel the, the surface away of this ancient knowledge and technology. And one of these days, we're going to convert one of these ruins into an inexhaustible source of energy. We're this far away from it. I am absolutely sure of that.